So welcome everybody um, uh, to today's conference, which is What Matters Most? Important Conversations for Living Dying Well with the Royal College of uh, GPs, Marie Curie and the End of Life Care Think Tank Partners. Um, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded onto the RCGP Daffodil Standards page where it will be available for everyone to view. You've all been muted and your cameras have been turned off and, as you've entered the webinar, so we request that you keep muted throughout the conference, please. We will, uh, you will be sent a link with a brief survey directly to your email shortly after the webinar, so please do help us by improving our webinars by filling this out. Um, so I'm Dr. Catherine Millington Sanders, RCGP and Marie Curie National End of Life Care Clinical Champion. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the RCGP Marie Curie and End of Life Care Partners Conference, What Matters Most Important Conversations for Living and Dying Well. At the start of the pandemic, we formed the RCGP and End of Life Care Partners Think Tank and What Matters Most Conversations have been an incredibly important topic for us and many people are the think tank here are presenting today. This conference aims to share ideas and inspiration to help us in our day-to-day -day practice as well as offering a starting point to build relationships and a community of practice. Above all, we really hope very much that you will enjoy the event, reflect and share your experiences and ideas in the chat, as well as challenging yourself to think what you could do differently in your own practice. The event split into four sections, an introduction to what matters most and building a social movement. Then we've got a practical session, putting what matters most into real time practice. Thirdly, we've got celebrating and sharing some really fantastic practice. And finally, the fourth section, we've got an inspiring end session, please don't miss it, from uh, Dr. Catherine Mannix, best-selling author and retired palliative care consultant, and that's titled Listening. As all our speakers are incredible communicators, we um, could easily listen to them for hours each and we've got them to keep to the task of short time slots. And hopefully without sounding too much like a game show, we will be giving a two minute warning to help us make sure we all keep to time. Instead of using the raise hand function, We'd really love you to generate discussion, ideas, share your thoughts in the chat function. As we move through the presentation, time permitting, the chair for each section will um, pull out questions once the presenter finishes, and they may also be able to answer them in the chat directly. Once again, thank you for joining us today. And without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Martin Marshall, the Royal College of GPs Chair and Julie Pierce, Chief Nurse for Marie Curie. They're our host for today and to formally open the afternoon with their joint keynote session. Martin, thank you and over to you. Catherine, thank you very much indeed and welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining this session, which is going to be a really exciting afternoon, it, it, it seems to me. So I'm Martin Marshall, I'm Chair of the Royal College of GPs. I'm a GP in Newham and East London and also an academic at uh, UCL. It's, it's a real pleasure to uh, have this opportunity to open this session um, and to share the opening uh, plenary with, with, with Julie. Uh, our partnership as a college with Marie Curie is, is one of our most valued, one of our most productive and one of our most important uh, partnerships. So it's great to be able to, um, uh, to be able to open this session. We're going to be talking about end of life care. Um, I guess we all know this is an issue that the pandemic has shone a light on. It's demonstrated some superb practice out there and it's demonstrated some less than good uh, practice as well. Lots of opportunities uh, to learn. It probably isn't surprising that uh, the pandemic has put um, pressure on the system that provides our end of life care. Um, we know that we didn't always get it right in peacetime before the pandemic. At a time of crisis, it's even more difficult. So there's never been um, a greater need to get end of life care right and we've got lots to learn together. It's a particularly important issue for general practice, I must say. We know that in the last two years, we've seen a lower proportion of deaths from cancer uh, in hospital, in care homes and in hospices, and a higher proportion at home. Uh, the proportion of people dying at home has increased by around about a third. This, I guess, is probably largely due to the pandemic, the fact that a lot of people just didn't want to go into hospitals. Hospitals weren't a great place to be in the middle of a pandemic. And of course, people were separated from their from their loved ones, from their families as well. I hope and think that it's a trend that will continue. It's a desirable trend to allow people to die at home. We know that more people uh, want to do so. 
Um, so we need to be prepared uh, for that trend. And we also need to be prepared with the other fallout from the pandemic, of course, which is the, the bereavement uh, crisis. We estimate that somewhere between three and four million people have been bereaved either directly by family members or by friends uh, over the last uh, two years. And that's why our college has been contributing very much to national work on bereavement. So we've got some really big challenges ahead and, and I'm delighted to work as a college with a whole range of partners, including Marie Curie, to address those challenges. And I'm really proud of some of the fantastic outputs that those partnerships have developed. Most strikingly, I think the, the What Matters Most work. This is an initiative, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that's leading a change in the language and is reframing uh, advanced care planning conversations. Um, this work is really important across all sectors of the health and care system, but it seems to be particularly important in, in general practice, not least because we know that 70% of the people dying in the community are being looked after by community teams who are generalists rather than specialists in palliative care. So this is a real opportunity for us to increase our skill set, to provide top quality care to up our game, if you like. What matters most conversations are part of a broader college priority for us on promoting shared decision making and on reinvigorating what we call relationship based care at a time when a lot of care in the health service because of the pandemic and because of workforce pressures is becoming increasingly transactional. Um, for a long time, I think general practice has been moving away from the traditional kind of doctor knows best patient is grateful recipient model. Uh, but many clinicians, I think, are only just recognising the extent to which shared decision making represents a major cultural change for the medical profession in particular, but also a technical change as well, our ability to be able to analyse and utilise data more effectively, to be able to have informed conversations with our patients. So there's an awful lot going on that we need to learn about, um, and that, that's very much what this session is about. So as more clinicians are finding that when we have what matters most conversations with patients, it changes what we do. We, of course, are still focused on symptom control. That's still a really important part of our job as clinicians. But increasingly, we're talking about other things. We're talking about we're having conversations about family, about friends, about jobs, about holidays, about where we live and what we eat, about our dogs, our music, our sport, lots of different things that we're talking about. And that's taking us as clinicians, particularly as doctors out of the medical space and into the caring space and that's both of course necessary for our patients uh, but also professionally satisfying at the same time. I think there's nothing more pleasing for patients and their families when end-of-life care goes according to plan when it goes well and there's nothing more satisfying as a clinician to be part of a team delivering that care. There's an awful lot that we've got to do and today's conference I think is a really important step along the way. So thank you very much for inviting me to open this conference and I'd like to hand over to Julie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, uh, for introducing the collaborative work of the RCGP and end of life care partners. And I would like to pay a special tribute actually to Dr. Ka uh, Kathleen Milliton Saunders and Dr. Adrian Tuckman, who inspired us in the early stages of the pandemic to do some really great work together. So to turn to what matters most conversations and in this year's nursing standards survey, which is joint, uh, run jointly with Marie Curie, we found that nursing staff were saying that during the pandemic, they feel they have grown in confidence when it comes to initiating conversations about what matters most to people. We know that talking with someone may not be a single conversation. It's likely to be a discourse over time that allows someone to articulate what's most important to them. These conversations allow the person to feel heard, to feel involved and able to be part of prioritizing what happens next, right until the end of their life. It is at the heart of holistic advance or anticipatory care planning. It's often quite small personal things rather than the grand gestures that are important to people, particularly in the last phase of their lives. We also know that when we get this right, it can help with the grieving process for their loved ones once the person has died. The pandemic has proven how unpredictable our lives can be, and people may now have more of a collective sense that life is precious and will come to an end for all of us. For some, that might be sooner than we expected. 
I think the frustration for health and care professionals is that they seems at times that there's not always enough time to have the regular conversations. And so perhaps this lack of time can act as a barrier for initiating and facilitating the conversation. We know that the current workforce crisis in health and social care is not going to be solved quickly. More people are dying at home. It is even more important that everyone providing care work together as a local team to ensure that as many people as possible have access to good quality generalist palliative and end of life care in their home. And this includes thinking about what matters most to conversations. So the RCGP and end of life care partners have started to reimagine what and who is involved. There's a growing awareness of the vast range of community support that's out there. Through compassionate neighbours and compassionate community initiatives, think about our families, our friends, formal and informal carers, volunteers. Think about what we can all do to understand what's important to those around us. When it comes to understanding people and what matters to them as they approach the end of life, working together with our communities and people who live in those communities must be part of the way forward. So Martin and I and those involved in organising this conference really hope you get a, a great deal from the sessions to support you in your everyday practice. We would love to hear about your experiences and ideas about how we can collectively ensure more people are having these very important conversations. It's fantastic and I, I for one feel incredibly lucky that we've had your um, both your support and leadership to be able to allow us to have this conference here today so it, it feels a great honour and I know that all of us from the think tank um, have been incredibly incited, excited to be able to come through with this. Uh, I don't know if there are any particular questions that actually we wanted to pull out. Um, I know that there have been lots of things saying how wonderful and um, supportive uh, the comments are for both you and and uh, Martin, um, so thank you. I think from a, a time perspective, um, we might just move to now to our sort of next session, if that would be okay. And I just want to thank you both for making time today in your schedule. Um, as, as an introduction, we've got to our, in our next session, we've got four incredible speakers. Um, having meaningful conversations around what matters to us is essential throughout our life and asking what matters most with patients and families helps personal wishes to be heard and understood and this is as we've heard particularly important in trying to reframe the traditional advanced care planning conversations and it can have such a big impact I think if we don't ask, then we just will never know. So in this first of the four sections, um, we've got, we'll hear about the origins of world, the worldwide wide movement. We've got things about activism and creating a social movement. And importantly, we're going to be hearing from two people who have experienced the good and also the bad of what matters most. And I think that these stories help ground us and also help us challenge ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives and our clinical practice of how and why we can use what matters most conversations to truly listen and to understand what and who matters most and when it matters most. So again, please do use the chat function, keep, your, um, keep yourselves muted and our speakers will try and get through the questions via the chat after their talk. And if we potentially have time, we'll pull out some of the key themes and questions as we go on. So I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. It's um, Maureen Bizonino. I may have said that incorrectly. Apologies, Maureen. Um, she is up bright and breezy because um, she's the president of uh, Emerita and a senior fellow at the Institute of Healthcare uh, for Improvement in Boston in the US. And in this session, Maureen will describe her personal passion for asking what matters and how the What Matters Most to You movement started some years ago. Maureen, thank you so much and over to you. Thank you so much and it's a joy to be with you all this morning, uh, this afternoon for you. I'm going to share my uh, screen here in a minute to, sh to show some um, pictures about why this matters. Does that look good okay? Great. Um, yeah. So I um, I wanted to share with you one a personal story and then two 
to tell you how we got this movement going um, to asking what matters to you. I'm the oldest of nine kids, a big Irish family here in Boston, Massachusetts. And this was my brother, Johnny. Um, when I was a young nurse, Johnny was the third um, of the nine kids. And he was the most handsome, warm, nice, bright kid that you ever met. He was the ball boy for the Boston Celtics. He's in the front row, the fourth from the left and just uh, always wanted me to marry one of these guys. But he had this way of in inviting everybody into his life. Um, when Johnny was uh, 18 years old, he uh, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. And he used to come up to my apartment all the time and he'd say, Maureen, I'm not gonna make it um, through the years of his chemotherapy and his radiation. And I thought as a young nurse that my job was to give him hope. So I would always be saying, no, Johnny, there's more radiation, there's more chemotherapy, don't give up, don't give up. And I kept thinking that that was my role. Um, when Johnny was in the hospital uh, once when he was a few years older, uh, the doctors came in one day and they were all standing around his bed with their white coats and they were all talking over him mostly and uh, about what they were gonna do next. And then uh, they left the room and one of the doctors came back in and he walked up and he changed everything for me. He walked up and he put his hand on Johnny's arm and he said, Johnny, what do you want? And my brother said, I wanna go home. And the doctor walked over to me and he took my jacket off me, didn't say a word. He wrapped it around my brother's shoulders he picked my brother up and he carried him out to my car. Nurses and doctors running down the hall after us saying, you can't do that. You're not his doctor. You can't discharge him. But what happened was he really taught me a lesson about asking, what, what do you want? And when we got Johnny home, I said, Johnny, what do you want? Just like the doctor did. And he said, I want to be 21. He turned 21 on November 25th. It happened to be Thanksgiving day. So I made him a cake that looked like a turkey and he died on December 1st, a few days later. But those last weeks we had with him at home meant everything to us. Um, these are his best friends. Uh, we got to talk to him about what his life was like, what his death would be like. It was a joyous couple of weeks that we had to spend with him that never would have happened without that doctor saying, Johnny, what do you want? And having the courage to send him home at a time when that wasn't the most common thing. So it changed everything for me in my profession. And I stopped thinking that I knew what was better for everybody. And I started asking, what do you want? Some years later, I was uh, flying to Paris uh, to give a plenary talk. Uh, this was about 2012, I think, or 13. And I was flying to Paris to give a plenary talk. And on the plane, I read an article on shared decision-making by Susan Edgman Levitin and Michael Barry from Mass General Hospital here in Boston. And in the article, there was a sentence that changed me again. And it said, we can't only ask what's the matter we have to ask what matters to you. So I ripped up my plenary on the plane, rewrote it. And when I got there to Paris, there were thousands of people in the audience and I gave them the challenge, go back and ask not only what's the matter, but what matters to you. And one of the first people who uh, connected with me after that talk is Jen Rogers. You'll hear from Jen a little bit later today but one of the first um, patients that she asked at her pediatric hospital in Glasgow was a young girl named Kendra. And Kendra has autism, um, has never spoken, She's seven years old. So Kendra and her father made this map that told everybody uh, what mattered to her. I'm very fast and I can put things in my mouth and I can make a run for it. Ha ha ha, I don't like medicine by my mouth. I'll struggle, it's a three person job. I like cuddles to reassure me. And I can dress myself with some help. Kendra um, didn't speak, 
And that evening, her father, who was her only caregiver, um, had a cardiac event and was taken to another hospital in Glasgow. But the doctors and nurses, because of Jen, knew how to take care of Kendra because she told them what mattered to her. So within a very short period of time, I started hearing from people around the world, Geraldine Marsh in the top with her uh, elderly patient population and a nurse in, um, in Brazil wrote me in uh, Portuguese. I started hearing from people around the world that when they asked the question in this way, it changed the way that they provided care. Um, a, a wonderful uh, group of leaders in Norway changed the way that they provided care in nursing homes. I know you've all seen these whiteboards, at least here in the United States, it used to look like the whiteboard was the patient's name, their age, their resuscitation status, and their doctor. Um, and now it has their picture, what matters most to them, what they like to be called, and then all the medical stuff. And I went to the nursing home before COVID and stood in front of this whiteboard and I said, tell me about this man. And they said, he's 88 and he wants two scotches every night at, at five o'clock. And I smiled and I said, tell me about this woman. And they said, it says in a Norwegian, never in capital letters, take me out of my room without my makeup on and my hair done. And I stood in front of the whiteboard and I said, I know these people because they changed the way we talk to people. Um, back here in the United States, uh, you might know Dr. Atul Gawande, but Atul and I connected and we started a national movement here to not only ask what's the matter, but to ask what matters to you, particularly in serious illness and, uh, and about dying. And we found that here in the United States, there was a huge audience for people who needed the tools and the kind of permission to ask the question. But meanwhile, everywhere around the world, people started to write to me and say that they had started this What Matters to You campaign. In Norway, again, amazing stories, um, particularly they started asking at the end of each shift, did anything make you smile? And almost every time it was a story about asking what matters to you a wonderful story about the most difficult man in a different nursing home. None of the staff liked to go in because he would fight with them all the time. And one of the um, assistants going in to bathe him uh, in the, at the end of her shift said, what matters most to you today? And he said, I want to wear my blue shirt. And she said, why do you want to wear your blue shirt? And he said, that was my wife's favorite shirt and she died two years ago today and I want to honor her. The whole time she bathed him, they talked about his wife. And then at the end, he said something he'd never said before. He said, put me in, in the wheelchair. I want to go out and talk to all the other people here about my wife. That's what mattered most to him. It spread to Brazil and Scotland, to Italy and British Columbia and to Denmark. And now the What Matters to You movement is making a difference in over 50 countries with teams all over the world finding that when they ask what matters to you, it changes the conversation for not only people and their families, but also for caregivers. So here uh, at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, we changed our whole way of thinking and created a framework for joy in work, especially in this COVID time. It's, it's such a struggle to every day go in and face the challenges that we face with with uh, personal protective equipment and, and now we're demonstrating the value of psychological protective equipment. But it all begins with asking staff what matters to you. And that's making a huge difference as you'll hear today. Uh, it's allowing people to have conversations that they perhaps didn't feel comfortable to have before, but uh, are really finding that having these conversations is helpful. It's helpful in making decisions about care. It's helpful in making decisions about end of life. And as Catherine said, it's helping with bereavement. It's helping people to live with the decisions that people are making, just like I felt much more comfortable after having the conversation with my brother, Johnny. So I had the wonderful opportunity to meet the Dalai Lama and he has taught me so much about living and, and uh, humanity. And I love this, 
way the world is interdependent as never before, which is why we need a keen sense of the oneness of all human beings. We have to take the whole of humanness into account. We have to understand what we have in common with everybody else. And that's what has led uh, Tul Gawande and, and me here in the United States to begin to ask this question and to ask people in all of the 50 countries around the world, what matters most to you? Because it's changing the care patterns. It's changing what we do. So I want to say thank you to you all for being here today. I've put a link here on this last slide to the whatmatterstoyou.world website. And I do hope that you're able to go on there, um, take some of the lessons and, and continue to share the experiences that we're all having because I think it's making a huge difference. Changing our care system from providing clinical care only to really reaching out to the person and their family, their support and their friends, and then bringing us all together for the best decisions in life. Never have I felt this was more important than this time of COVID. So I'm so grateful to be with you all here today. And I don't know if you have, uh, if we have any time for questions, but um, I did want to um, offer you the challenge today to not only ask what's the matter, but what matters to you. Gosh, thank you so much, Maureen, for um, starting off. We do, we've got a, a number of wonderful comments. There are things like these stories are so very powerful and bring what matters most to life. Thank you. Um, I think we get stuck thinking personalized care is complicated. Perhaps not if we start with one simple question. Um, so, and another person has said, just this morning, my next door neighbor dropped in to say hello. Her mother-in-law died in her home recently, and my wife died at home in 2020. We've long helped each other and shared the view that the core caring team and extended community both need guidance to manage dying at home in a positive way. And I think it really feels like um, using what matters most in a sensitive way can enable people to have that positive feeling in, in times of helplessness despair. I, I wanted to ask Maureen, you touched briefly on bereavement and I think we often focus very much on the anticipatory part of death and dying. that's really important for planning the future, for living well. But I wondered in your experience of um, how you can use what matters most potentially for grief and bereavement and how we can support people uh, in different times after a death. Well what we have found uh, both in my own personal experiences and in our work across the United States, is that when you ask the question and you know and you act on that, it really does help you afterward. Uh, you know, my conversations with my brother were about his dying, uh, not only his living, and it made such a huge difference to the whole family. You can imagine there were little, my little brothers and sisters were, you know, in, in the nine and 10 year old uh, age range, but they helped him die. Everybody had a job. My littlest sister would rub cream on his feet every morning and every night. Everybody had a job. And we knew that we were helping him in a situation that this was what care looked like. And afterward, we came together and told stories. We keep pictures. And, and um, it, it, not only in my brother's passing, but in others in our family, we found that really having these conversations gave us a sense of joy in their life and helped us afterwards when they died. Thank you again. I've, I've got one um, sort of comment, I think, query in the chat. Maureen, thank you for sharing. As an Irish nurse, we ask patients, what do you want for yourself and the families too? And then we begin to facilitate. It's an opportunity for humor and serious conversations, but I've observed that professionals often find it hard to start with as they have to reveal something of themselves. Have you got any suggestions? Because I think sometimes it is, I know we go into the practice uh, session in, in more detail, but any sort of reflections for that importance of starting, having the confidence just to tip it over to start? Yeah, I think I, this is something that Atul and I have worked on quite a bit, which is how do you um, begin the conversation? And really we found that asking what matters most to you today um, what matters most to you this week? Uh, what, what can I do today? Um, just it, without any conversation about death in the beginning, but just let's talk about today. Let's make today great. And then that gives you a little bit of sense of comfort and familiarity with 
with the conversation. And then that, I think, opens doors to continue the conversation about what matters most this week, what matters most to you in relationships. And it's been such a joy to have these conversations with family and friends, because when they stop and think about what today means to me, um, what can we do? Let, let's have a special meal that reminds us, or um, let, let's pull out uh, some old notes and, and share uh, lessons that we have left with each other. And then I found that having these conversations, even once a week with your family over dinner, gets people to think about the meaning of life, you, especially in COVID times, when everybody's just running through their days, to actually stop and have these conversations from time to time brings joy and also opens our eyes as to what matters to people. Maureen, I'm so grateful. I'd just like to end with one comment. I asked this question of my father-in-law who died a month ago. Um, it just made the experience so much easier to navigate and guide his care as well as our grief experience. Um, it's really impacted how I view approaching care and bereavement with others. On that note, Maureen, I would just love to thank you so much for joining us, A, very early for you, and really to share your incredible experiences, both personally with your brother, thank you, and also, you know, the incredible work that you've led and are sharing worldwide. So really grateful. Thank you so much. Thank um, you to you, and thank you to everybody who will take some of these lessons back. I appreciate you. Thank you, Maureen. Now... We're moving on to another incredible um, speaker. His name is Chris Lubby. Chris is an activist and a passionate storyteller and leads a team who tells the story of personalized care so that stories of people with lived experience can be told. And I'm not gonna ruin the surprise of um, what he's gonna talk about. And Chris is gonna tell us ourselves, tell, him, tell, him, tell us himself. Um, so without further ado, Chris, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very, very much, Catherine. It's such an honor to be able to speak to you all. Uh, and um, I'm currently based in sunny Hampshire and <laughs> just to share with you, I'll just do that thing where I share my screen. One second, it's got it. Am I on? Brilliant. Yes. So I had the honor of, and I'm, I'm not very short-winded, so I've got to really try and stick to time. I know Catherine <laughs> will tell me off. I had the honor of working with two of the most incredible people in the world in the form of Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. I met Nelson Mandela after he was released from prison and uh, was really shocked when he asked me to serve as one of his bodyguards. And he was fascinated by the fact that I was taller than him. I'm six foot four and, and the fact that I took size 14 shoes. And so that was probably one of the shortest interviews I've ever had in my life and it lasted all of five minutes. And so I worked with this incredible man and just learned so much from him and uh, traveled quite extensively. And, uh, you know, it was, it was nine years, it was almost as if I was, at, I'd spent nine years at the University of Nelson Mandela uh, with all the, the things that I'd learned from this amazing man. And sadly he died on, uh, you know, on the 5th of December 2013, he died on my birthday, which is a bit of, of a sad day for me because, um, but I'd made a promise to him that I would go around the world. He was, he was very, very keen that I would, I should go around speaking to young people and children. So I do a lot of work in schools talking about inequality, discrimination, and inspiring young people to become their best. And so the other person that really had quite a big impact on me was Desmond Tutu. I actually met Desmond Tutu when Nelson, Nelson Mandela was still in prison. Now uh, Desmond Tutu, Tutu joined in with us in standing up against apartheid. He joined our social movement uh, in getting rid of those discriminatory laws that we had in South Africa. And uh, I heard Maureen mention the Dalai Lama, and of course Desmond Tutu was extremely mischievous. He was always laughing, 
and uh, we once visited the Dalai Lama at Dharamasala at his home and uh, so and, and you, it was almost like watching two mischievous boys who were constantly up to mischief. They were constantly laughing and constantly taking the mickey out of people and playing tricks on people, which is just for two holy men, it was very, very odd. So it was no wonder that the two of them collaborated and wrote the Book of Joy together, and uh, uh, which is quite an incredible book. So Jasmine Tutu had an interesting uh, take on dying and death. In fact, he contacted me one day out of the blue and he said to me, look, I just wanted to let you know that I'm at the departures lounge. And so I said, oh, where are you flying to father? And he said, oh, he says, no, I'm not flying anywhere. I'm dying. And he started laughing. And uh, which is typical Desmond Tutu. And of course he told me he'd been suffering with prostate cancer. And so my wife and myself and the, our two boys visited and we spent time with him in Cape Town and he signed all his children's books for our sons, which was quite incredible. And we parted ways and uh, said goodbye. And uh, sadly, you know, he, he also died uh, on the 26th of December last year. Uh, his wife tells me that he died <laughs> laughing. He died with a smile on his face, just exactly the way he lived. So, so he was just quite an incredible man. So ladies and gentlemen, I had a, a life-changing experience at the age of eight years old when my mom and I were traveling on a bus in South Africa. We boarded a bus during a very, very difficult time in South African history, where to coin a phrase from Martin Luther King, the color of your skin was more important than the content of your heart during this very difficult time called apartheid. So we got on, my mom paid the fare and we were on our way to the city. But halfway through our journey, my mom took ill. She had type one diabetes. She started to feel like she's gonna get dizzy and faint. And so she, and of course we didn't have any mobile phones in South Africa. So I couldn't take out my phone and call 911 or nine, you know, triple nine to get the emergency services. So my mom asked me to please ring the bell, which I did. I pressed the bell once, twice, three times, thinking that the bus would stop. It didn't. And so I went to the front of the bus, spoke to the driver and I asked him to please, uh, if you could stop the bus so we could please get off. My mom was not feeling well. And the driver said, look, my son, I'm so sorry to tell you that unfortunately we're traveling through a whites only area and I'm not allowed to drop off non-white people. And uh, he said, please tell your mom to hold on. And because as soon as we get into the city, I'll stop the bus and I'll help you to get your mom off the bus. So I went back to my seat, told my mom and hold on, she did. And as soon as we got into the city, the driver stopped the bus and turned up the engine and him and other passengers helped me to get my mom off the bus. The only problem was he stopped the bus not far from this particular bench. And I was warned by my dad to stay very, very far from anything that said whites only because we were not allowed to be there. So I suggested to the driver, we'd rather let my mom sit on the pavement so we don't get into trouble. And the driver said, no, your mom is diabetic. We'll explain when the police come. And of course, we got my mom, we put my mom just on the left-hand side of the bench and I was standing next to her holding her hand. And uh, eventually after about 25 minutes, you know, people were trying desperately to help, but nobody quite knew what to do. Uh, the driver came, he was very apologetic. He said to my mom and I, look, I'm so sorry, but unfortunately I've got to get passengers to their destination. Some need to get to work. And he wished us luck and he, he said, look, I've got to go and got into the bus, started the engine and everybody else followed him. And there I was left all alone with my mom, eight years old, not knowing what to do. And she seemed to be getting worse. And so I stopped the very, very first person that came past and I asked him whether he could please go and make a phone call to call the ambulance because uh, my mom was feeling very, very ill and he agreed. And so I took some money out of her purse, gave it to him and he ran off, tried to find a call box. And the only call box that was available was for whites only. He was black. He was not allowed to use that call box. There were a lot of policemen around and he was afraid to get arrested. So 
he managed to convince a white lady who was standing by the bus to make the call on his behalf, and she did. And uh, meanwhile, back at the bench, two very, very tall policemen came along and without saying a word, lifted my mom off the bench and she was thrown onto the pavement. And I was absolutely shocked. I just couldn't believe what I just witnessed. I couldn't believe that human beings could behave in such an appalling manner. And these two white policemen just walked off and left my mom laying there. Blood was pouring out from the back of her head. Her eyes were closed. And I was just only eight. I didn't know anything about CPR or anything. And I desperately tried to wake my mom up. I was very, very angry and very sad, but she was not responding. And so in the mind of an eight-year-old child, I thought she must be dead. And so I just knelt next to her and I cried. And so the man returned from making the call and he was shocked to see my mom laying in a pool of blood. He tried to get her up, but she was not responding. So thankfully a nurse who was on her way to work stopped and she took control, examined my mom and she said, look, your mom's not dead, her heart is still beating. And I felt a little bit better, but that, day everything changed for me uh, and to cut a long story short my the ambulance eventually arrived after about three hours uh, I got in with my mom into the ambulance we were taken to the non-whites hospital where the doctors examined my mom for a very very long time and uh, the one doctor came out and said to me look we need to speak to your dad your mom is actually uh, slipped into a coma which I didn't know on earth what on earth that is uh, nobody bothered to explain and uh, the nurse eventually said oh your mom's unconscious which is I couldn't even spell the word unconscious so I didn't know what she was talking about anyway she said your mom he could die at any moment and I just started crying all over again so fortunately my dad had given me a phone number with his boss's number you know where he worked and I gave that to the doctor and the doctor called my dad and the rest of my family when we they all came to the hospital. We spent the entire night at the hospital thinking mom was going to die that night. And for the next three months, every day we went to the hospital. And at the end of the third month, thinking that, oh, tonight she's going to go, she's going today. And eventually at the end of the third month, a miracle happened. My mom came out of the coma and started to get better, started to eat again, started to speak again and uh, eventually after a very very slow recovery was eventually discharged from hospital and so that had quite a very very big impact on me and that's really the experience that turned me into, into the activist that i was to become which really changed me it got me starting to think about discrimination and inequality in the world and so the backdrop of all of that as i mentioned earlier on was the system called apartheid in South Africa, where everything was segregated. Uh, you know, there was a different, you lived in different suburbs and the whole aim being to keep the different races apart and laws were introduced. And so you were either classified, uh, you know, white, Asian, colored or mixed race like myself or black. Those were the four race categories. But if you were white, you got to enjoy all the privileges of being a South African. Whereas if you were non-white, you were excluded. You didn't matter. My mom didn't matter. And so this really got me, uh, uh, you know, uh, really excited or enthused about standing up and, and trying to speak out against the inequality that existed in our country because everywhere you went, there were signs that told you where you could and couldn't go, whether it was public toilets, public transport, you know, even where you lived, beaches had signs on them. And every part of life was segregated. And, uh, you know, of course, Nelson Mandela was in prison. Uh, he was already, he was sentenced to life imprisonment long before I was born. And he was not allowed to mention his name. He was on a, a, at a place called Robben Island, just off the coast of Cape Town. And he was in a very, very tiny prison cell. And so 
I decided without, you know, my friends and I, when I got to high school, we decided without even having a leader, we decided that we were going to protest against the system that nearly killed my mom. We were going to protest against the system that kept Nelson Mandela in prison. And of course, the government would send in the police and the army and many of my friends, some as young as 13 and 14 years old, were shot and killed and dragged through the streets. And I myself at the tender age of 14 was arrested for the very, very first time, uh, you know, leading a protest. And so, you know, I was put in prison for a period of three months in a prison cell with murderers and rapists and treated really badly, tortured and waterboarded, and had various spells of imprisonment. So I made a decision that I was going to continue and, you know, spoke out and at, at you know, conferences and, and, you know, events that we had. And of course, this was a point where I met Desmond Tutu and he would join in with us. He would uh, join in the marches with us. He was always quite hilarious. One day he said to us, you know, even though we're not allowed to swim on whites only beaches, do you know that we are allowed to jog on a whites only beach? And of course, from then on, we had these regular jogging sessions on whites only beaches, knowing that we couldn't get arrested. And of course, he was always a source of strength and comfort to us. Uh, and, you know, he, he provided that protection. But he refused to accept that he was a leader. He always said he's just a follower, just like the rest of us. And of course, these were very, very difficult times, particularly in the 80s, where people were going missing, people were being arrested and beaten up. Uh, you know, our leaders, most of them were in, either in exile or in prison or, you know, executed uh, because you were not allowed to speak out against apartheid. We were constantly staring at policemen with guns. And at the age of 20, again, I was arrested and sentenced to a year in prison. Uh, and I went was sent to a prison in Cape Town where Nelson Mandela was once held. And uh, every day for the rest of the year, I was made to stand, you know, I was either waterboarded in the morning or in the evening. And in my first week, I was made to stand under a cold shower for a whole week without any food or sleep. But I was really, really determined that I was going to do something to make a difference. And on the last day, the prison major had a meeting with me and he said, don't get involved in any more protest marches. I was given a tag. And uh, of course, what did I do when I came out? I organized another protest march. And of course, our resilience and determination paid off because Nelson Mandela was released on the 11th of February tomorrow, you know, what, almost 39 years ago now. And uh, so it, it was just an amazing day. And of course, he carried the hope of the nation on his shoulders. It was interesting to hear him speak instead of being an angry man, Nelson Mandela started to talk about leaving bitterness and hatred behind. He started to talk about forgiving. He started to work with these enemies, the people that put him in prison to negotiate a free and democratic South Africa. And I was just really, really surprised and shocked that, you know, he was prepared to forgive. And of course, we had our first democratic elections where my parents who had never voted before got to vote. And, uh, and, and that was quite an experience and quite an incredible being part of that movement who brought about that change in South Africa. And I'm talking about just very, very ordinary people who made that decision to do something, to speak out, to be part of this big movement for change. Where I come from in South Africa, I come from a place called Durban, which is on the east coast of South Africa, we speak Zulu and we have a Zulu greeting which says Saubona. And Saubona means I see you. And it's a, it's a very, very strange way to be greeting someone, I'm sure you must admit. And it really literally means I see you. And until I say 
Sarubona, until I say, I see you, you don't exist. So you bring me into existence when you say the word Sarubona. And so often, particularly in medicine, when we look at people, we tend to look at their medical diagnosis or we tend to look at their condition. We, we do not tend to look at the whole person. And I think it's very, very important for us to see people and take a more holistic view and be mindful of people's social conditions whenever we see them. And that's what this amazing greeting is. It's all about understanding that we've got to look at the whole person and not just look at their diagnosis or their condition. Nelson Mandela had a plaque on his wall in his office, which says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. He taught us this amazing African philosophy called Ubuntu. And Ubuntu teaches us that I am because of you and you are because of me and together we are. He told us this amazing story of this American professor that visited Africa and he watched these little children playing on a field and he went off to a shop and bought a whole lot of fruit. He got a table, put it on one side of the field, called the children to the other side of the field and said, right, I'm going to teach you a new game. And he said, I'm going to count down from 10 to zero and whoever can get to the fruit first can have it all. And he counted down and when he got to zero something strange happened instead of the children rushing to the fruit they joined hands and walked towards the fruit and shared the fruit and enjoyed it together and so he asked the little girl why did you do that and she said because of ubuntu how can i be happy and the others are sad so Ubuntu teaches us that I am because of you and you are because of me and together we are. Together. It's only together, whether it's, it's the, voluntary, involunt, you know, the voluntary sector, whether it's social care, whether it's education, the government, the general public, it's together that we're going to make a difference. These days, I'm still an activist. I work for the Southwest Integrated Personalized Care Team and we are part of the NHS. And we are, I work with an incredible team of people who are, you know, who are involved in rolling out wide scale personalized care in the Southwest. And we are led by an, an amazing and incredible person called Francis Tippett. And what gets us out of bed every day, what gets me out of bed is that magic question what matters to you and it's understanding that it's about giving people choice it's about people's human right to be asked what matters to you and that's and it's about listening it's about you know listening to what people have to say and not just prescribing it's about just working with people and becoming equals one day in a fit of despair i asked nelson mandela how can i make a difference the world is in such a mess and he brought me a picture of a mosquito and he asked me if i've ever come across a mosquito and i said yes and he said have you seen how tiny a mosquito is and i said yes very very tiny and then he said something that really changed my life he said if you think you're too small or insignificant to make a difference you haven't spent a night with a mosquito and I think what the great man was trying to tell me is that every one of us can make a difference in the world, regardless of where we are, who we are, or how insignificant we feel we are. Desmond Tutu said, hope is being able to see that, uh, that you know, th that there is light despite all the darkness. Today, I'm filled with hope because I believe that we have a great opportunity we are in a position to, we are on the cusp of making a difference. We are going to be part of something great. We can make a difference because education, as Nelson Mandela said, is probably one of the most, you know, uh, powerful weapons that we can use to change the world. That's what Nelson Mandela said. 
And I just believe that we can educate, we can work with all different sectors. I do a lot of work in schools, in, in, in doing talks about discrimination. There's opportunities for us to engage with schools, with head teachers. You'll find me, apart from the work that I do with the Southwest Integrated Personalized Care Team, you'll find me in schools talking to children. And I just believe there's an opportunity for us to get involved <clears throat> in working with children, working with teachers. I speak at head teachers conferences. I speak to women's institutes. I speak at, you know, Rotary clubs. So I want to encourage you to join in and the social movement for change. And let's make a difference. Come on the journey with us. And if you want to join us, please feel free to contact me. And thank you very, very much for listening. Keep positive, but stay COVID negative. Thank you very, very much. Chris, as usual, that is inspiring. And it's too late, by the way, because I put your Twitter handle in very early on in the chat. So <laughs> please <laughs> um, connect everyone. And uh, I just had a, a few, sort of collected a few of the comments. Um, I mean, I, I know firsthand from when you, you first joined the RCGP and Life Care Partners Think Tank that you're an incredible source of insight and leadership. And you have certainly walked by our sides in the think tank and you've challenged us and helped us already come so far when we were struggling to think, how do we create and start a movement? And it was really sort of with your guiding light and wisdom um, of just helping us sort of think through where, how do we even start that? And in true Ubuntu, we are because of you and we are definitely together we are and better together because of that. Um, Southwest uh, IPC and schools that you visit are clearly very, very lucky to have you. Some of the comments are, I love the concept of I see you. So important in my world of dementia care. And that rings just so true for such a group of people that often just are absolutely not seen. Um, it's also, someone says, it's about wanting to be seen for all um, we've been through um, throughout my life, not just as an end-of-life care patient. And if that's something that we can take into our clinical practice, um, there's so much more in what you were talking about, but from the clinical practice, um, we're not just an end of life care patient or not just a dementia patient. To be able to understand that is just a real privilege um, to be able to walk by someone's side clinically with that. And I think it's also very important, Catherine, that people understand that, you know, we place too much emphasis sometimes on leadership. It's all about the leader and leadership. And if we really, really, care about creating a movement let's just become followers which is what desmond tutu alluded to always whenever he spoke and you know we we can just become followers followers and and just follow and uh, you know whether you're acting alone or you know or, or however you want to do it uh, you know just become follower and have the guts to be the one to take the stand and just join in and I think that's how we're going to create a movement for change is that if we just if we just join in and become followers together and, and just work together and take this journey. And I believe we'll become a movement for change, a social movement for change. And that's what we did in South Africa. There were no our leaders were all in prison or in exile. Uh, we just uh, we just took a stand and followed and, and now I encourage people to do the same just make a decision today that you're gonna and, and I'll be very very happy to work with whoever wants to share the what matters to you story in schools because that's my domain that's where I work and I'm happy to lead uh, on, on some kind of initiative where we can actually get that question going in, within our schools, because I believe, as Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world. On that note, um, please do, could you put your, your details as well, the contact details and any of the, I know you've done quite a lot on social media um, and are connecting uh, people. If you could share that maybe for everyone in the chat, that would be amazing. And once again, thank you so much.
But ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to stop there. Um, the fabulousness continues. And for our next speaker, I would, and I'm really um, so incredibly grateful for Joe Armstrong, who is speaking this time from a very personal capacity as a carer. Um, uh, as she, as she cared for her husband who died in November 2020. And she works also as a phys physiotherapist in spinal cord injury rehabilitation at the National Spinal Injury Centre for Stoke Mandeville. And um, would really like to warmly welcome uh, Jo, because it is incredibly difficult sometimes telling your personal story. So very, very grateful that um, she's, she's willing and here to share that with us today. So. Joe, if I can hand over to you, if that's okay. Just Thank you. Me. Thank you, Catherine. So I'm going to speak today um, about my experience as a family member impacted by terminal illness. So Barry Armstrong, um, in the picture there, was an incredible person who lived an incredible life. He was a humanitarian aid worker who thought hard and fought hard to improve the lives of people affected by war or natural disaster. He worked in many different countries from Central and Southeast Asia to the Middle East. Our two boys pictured there were born in Sri Lanka and schooled in Jordan. Barry was diagnosed with multiple aggressive brain tumours in the spring of 2019. Our children were 10 and 12 and he had been due to run a marathon the weekend before. On Easter Thursday, we were given the weekend to decide whether to go ahead with high-risk neurosurgery or adopt a more cautious approach. As we reeled from the diagnosis, what mattered to us was to be able to access support to talk through this decision with an informed professional. Easter weekend does not lend itself to this and the MDT, the multidisciplinary team, was the, on the Tuesday. A friend who is a palliative care consultant linked us in to a neuroradiologist who support and supported us with talking through our options. We accessed this due to our social capital. But really, uh, as opposed to the recommendation with incurable cancer diagnosis, starting the journey with palliative input is, is so helpful. The skills that this profession has in listening and supporting can ease the heavy lifting that you have to do as a family. We've always been an active family. What mattered to us was to keep living life in as full and normal way as possible. We went interrailing around Europe the summer post radiotherapy and continued to push any envelope that we could. By 2020, three neurosurgeries later, and chemotherapy, various chemos and radio, Barry had told that he had exhausted all active treatment options. Despite anticipating this news, it still felt like a heavy blow. We had already requested a formal referral to palliative care input prior to this, but traditionally our, our oncologists would not have requested this. And being told that there is no more options and then being ditched by your team is harsh. So again, starting early with palliative involvement, I think is so important. As Barry deteriorated, I needed a lending library of kit, but all I was ever offered were basic grab rails and a hospital bed. But I needed a boxier ankle splint, then a neuromalleola splint, then a toe off splint to keep him, help keep him on his feet, then a wheelchair with a canvas backrest, then a wheelchair with a more supportive backrest and a mobility scooter. And some of these kits were pieces of equipment for quite short periods of time. This mattered to us as these pieces of kit enabled us as a family to stay active. When one of the lockdowns finally ended, we were able to go camping thanks to temporary ramps, mobility scooters and other things. I work in spinal cord injury and I'm so grateful that I could raid Stoke Mandeville's orthotics and wheelchair stock. But this is not most people's um, opportunity. There was no option for fast bespoke orthotics or seating input through cancer services and I would love to see this service being offered. Barry became increasingly more challenging to transfer and move. With COVID-19 restrictions what mattered to us was time with him and allowing friends and family to be able to spend time. This was only possible if Barry stayed at home. A hospice at home nurse organised a fast track continuing healthcare funded input. This was done without assessing either Barry or our home situation. 
As a consequence, the care package was not fit for purpose. I did not need two carers coming in to provide lunch, when I was at home anyway, but not coming when Barry needed the toilet. I often sent them away and then bitterly regretted this 45 minutes later. It was actually the care agency who suggested that given our situation, a live-in carer would be ideal. I, as a clinical therapist working in the NHS, had no idea that this was, a, this was even a possibility. So I approached Continuing Healthcare to request this. And I felt like we were being assessed, well, we weren't assessed, or were asked to choose without anyone ever showing us the menu. Continuing Healthcare are a brutal organisation to deal with. And I say this without reservation. In the end, I wrote Barry's care assessment. I argued on the telephone. I did not let the team fob me off, they tried. They used jargon, phrases such as, have you got universal services in place first? After questioning, I found that meant a GP and an occupational therapy assessment. Yes, I had that. They told me they had a duty of care to Barry. So despite my clinical background and my current manual handling skills, I could not act as a second carer. So if they sent a, a live-in carer, they would need to put an additional carer in and remove any nighttime care. I had to ask where that duty of care went to, how, where it evaporated to between the hours of 8 p.m. and 7 a.m. when Barry was up repeatedly through the night, was agitated, distressed and called out. Moving forwards, eventually, after a formal complaint and repeated calls, I secured an adequate care package. Barry was able to die at home with his family around him and as he was cared for at home, I could sit with him and then I could go into the garden and chop up a pallet of wood with an axe um, or whatever I needed to do to let off steam, knowing that he was not alone due to having access to an amazing living carer. This helped me cope and this helped me do some normal activities like take my children to school and keep some normality for them. And this mattered to us. Moving forwards, I would like to have had the fast track continuing healthcare process properly explained to us as a family and being asked what mattered to us with his care. I would like to have, I'd like us to have actually been assessed so that his physical, his spiritual, his mental health needs were all, take, were all taken into consideration and that our situation as a family was, was also in the mix and my clinical skills and potential contribution as a carer. I would like continuing healthcare to act on assessments rather than invest energy trying to cut costs. It was insulting to have a care package instated for a life limiting illness and then immediately reviewed within a month to see if our situation had changed. And maybe that care wasn't needed. Others in our situation should not have to rely on social capital, on clinical reasoning and being able to argue to secure care to support what matters to them in the final stages of living. So please do spend that time to ask people what matters most. Thank you. Jo, thank you so much. Um, and why it is so important that actually we have these personal stories to help us challenge. I mean, yours is a very personal story and quite recent. And I mean, each detail, as you shared, hit a note of why what matters most along a person and a, a family's journey is so important to find out. And I'm sure we're all hearing how wrong it was that you actually had to fight um, for that just because of your, your clinical perspective and imagining how people that weren't necessarily in your position as well, how much worse that could have been as well. Um, your story matters so much for all of us because it emphasizes that so much can be possible with what matters most conversations and sometimes things aren't possible and we'll, we'll hear a bit more about what we can do about that later later on in the program um, but also the importance of what happens when we don't ask and the importance of listening giving people the opportunity to know what is possible um, sounds like could have made so many times the biggest difference just for you I wondered if you've got any sort of passing reflections for us all as sort of clinical teams in the room as an ask, because I know you're passionate about wanting to make a difference with your story and thank you. Um, so I think assessing somebody before a care package is put in would be the fundamental. I'm a clinician and I don't uh, start any input with a patient without an assessment. I feel it's a basic fundamental 
And so looking, looking and meeting somebody first or asking some, being curious about their situation is really important. Um, I felt we were subject a little bit to SOPs and I follow Catherine Mannix, who I understand is speaking later on Twitter. And Catherine messaged something a while ago saying expect high standards in palliative care. And I thought, yes, I'm going to do that. And I'm so glad I did because it meant I argued for a more nuanced treatment approach rather than sedation and pain relief that wasn't indicated at that time. And that um, helped my husband be more awake, alert and able to interact much more with his extended family when sedation was, was stopped. Well, we're very lucky, um, A, from the type of Zoom that we've got, and I can also see Catherine's little face down on my Zoom thing. Catherine, do you want to come back on that? Just because we're lucky, very lucky to have you here. Thank you. So, thank you so much. I, I'm just thinking as I'm hearing the story of so many things that you say where there's something inside me that's nodding in recognition. And the phrase uh, that... Um, the standard we walk past is the standard we accept and support comes to my mind. And knowing that we can demand excellence gives us some elbow grease to get there and demand it, doesn't it? But every one of us who's nodding with you recognises elements of this story, which will, be, which will vary by locality, but elements of this story which are about having to work far harder than you should because services are, seem to be dedicated to what the service can provide and not what matters to the people who are receiving the service. So it's, it's upside down and it's absolutely um, what Maureen was talking about at the beginning of the afternoon, that they knew all about what was the matter and nothing about what mattered to you. Catherine, thank you. And Joe, I just want to once again thank you. I know you're in the middle of um, a busy clinical day as well so for sharing your time. So incredibly grateful. And um, thank you for joining and sharing your story. And now I'm going to come to our, our um, last of the speakers within this section, and then we'll be having a, a, a five minute break. So Please can I uh, introduce Andy Holness, who is um, a fabulous speaker and is passionate about personalised care and became an NHS England Improvement Personalised Care peer leader after the death of his son, Matthew. Andy is going to talk about how understanding what mattered most to Matthew ensured he received the best care right up until the end of his life. Andy, welcome. And also, I know you're, um, you've changed your work schedule all around for us. So really <laughs> grateful for you, you coming today. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'm really grateful. I'm incredibly humbled by being asked to present alongside the, the amazing speakers we've already seen. Um, I thought I'd start by just telling everybody a little bit about Matthew so you could understand the sort of man he was. Uh, Matthew loved music pretty much from the moment he was born and as he grew up his favourites were classical, blues, jazz and even heavy metal. He had a very eclectic taste in music. Um, when he was seven years old he told us he wanted to be a doctor which as we grew to understand as he grew was because he was just a huge humanitarian he wanted to care for people um, at the age of seven as well he started to play the clarinet um, and by the time he reached 16 he passed his grade eight and he was playing in a dixieland jazz band he then announced he was going to, learn to play the piano so he went from nothing to grade eight in 18 months playing the piano um, he loved keeping tropical fish what Matthew didn't know about tropical fish wasn't really worth knowing. Um, and what was most important to him above all was his family and his dog, Jasmine. Uh, we were a very close family. Um, Matthew then went off to medical school following his, his, uh, his plan. He just finished his second year finals in 2010 and he was diagnosed with a grade three brain tumor. He had surgery to remove that um, he then went to see his oncologist who said to him, right, well, it's chemotherapy or radiotherapy. But she understood Matthew. So she understood that what was most important to Matthew above all else was to become a doctor. So whilst radiotherapy was probably a slightly better option, she said the trouble is if you have that, it could very likely 
affect your cognitive capabilities and thereby affect your studies. So they agreed with, between them, it was shared decision making, that he would have the chemotherapy. So he had the chemotherapy, he had a year off, went back, finished his third year, had a second regrowth, had two lots of surgery, chemo and radio, had another year off, went back, finished his fourth and fifth year, graduated as a doctor, and he started work as an F1 in our local A&E, and after about six weeks or so, he was diagnosed with a third regrowth. Um, the team locally who were treating him at the time said, that's it, there's nothing we can do. You've got between three and six months to live, so basically go home and enjoy what was left of your life. Um, we weren't accepting that, so I went across the country, spoke to several top brain surgeons. They all said, uh, we agree with your team, there's nothing that can be done. Um, Matthew had found an oncologist in London who was at leading edge of the immunology treatment for brain tumours. So we went up to see that chap. He told us there's nothing I can do, but actually I think one of my colleagues who works at the same hospital can. So his colleague, a brain surgeon, said, well, it's very risky, but again, if you're willing to take the risk, then I'm willing to go in and see what I can do. So the day before Christmas Eve 2015, the surgeon went in and took out 99.9% .9 of a brain tumour everybody else said they couldn't touch, which as Matthew called it, it was his Christmas miracle. He then had six months of good life, um, but then around summertime and sort of into the autumn, his wounds started to break down and he ended up back in London in hospital uh, with brain infections. He had two bouts in ITU. The second bout, early 2017, he was there for six weeks and then the team said to us, uh, that's it, he's got about two weeks to live. Um, what do you want to do? And we said, well, it's in, we know it's important for Matthew to be at home. It's important for us to have him at home. So they effectively fast-tracked him with the local authority so that we had a full hospice at home uh, when we brought him home, he was completely paralysed, he was peg-fed, the only way he could communicate was to blink his eyes for yes and no, uh, but we knew the real Matthew was still in there. Uh, then Matthew, as he always did, didn't follow the rules, he actually started to get better, so that by Christmas uh, 2017, he regained the use of the left-hand side of his body, he could feed himself three square meals a day, he could talk in short sentences and it, he was back to the mischievous Matthew. Uh, we had carers who would come in three times a day, somebody would sit with him overnight and he was forever playing them up. Um, he had a wicked sense of humour um, and it, I, we were sat here having coffee one day, the carers used to come in, they'd get Matthew washed and changed, they'd put him in his wheelchair and we'd all sit and have coffee together. Um, it occurred to me, wouldn't it be nice for Matthew to have a shower? Now the thing is, Matthew couldn't get upstairs because of the paralysis down the left hand, uh, down the right hand side of his body. Um, so I went out, I bought a children's paddling pool, I bought a garden gazebo, I bought some shower curtains, I bought an extra length of hose, and I ran the power shower from upstairs, downstairs. The OT got us a shower chair so that we could wheel Matthew into the shower, we could pull the curtains around him for a little bit of privacy. He would need one or other of us to actually get in there to help him wash. And this is where the carers rolled the trousers up, took their shoes and socks off. We quite often got wet, but we would laugh and we would have fun. And it meant Matthew could have a shower. And if you will think about going a week, month or even more without a shower, just the, the pleasure in simply having a shower is just amazing. Didn't stop there then, because then that set me thinking, he was either in bed or he was in, in his wheelchair all day, every day. And he used to complain about his joints getting stiff and his muscles aching. So I bought an inflatable jacuzzi. And I'd blow the jacuzzi up in the living room, fill it full of hot water. And then three times a week, Matthew and I would have a hot tub. I would give him some hydrotherapy. We would listen to music. We would watch the telly. And again, we would just laugh and have fun. Um, Again, thinking back to uh, when he was uh, younger, his love of classical music. So we actually took him to the Royal Albert Hall to see uh, a classical spectacular. We didn't only do it once, we did it twice. It was a military operation, but we took him up there to watch classical music. Uh, we even took him on holiday. And again, each time we suggested these things, the OT and the carers, they'd roll their eyes, but they'd buy into it. So we even took him away on holiday. Um, then around the April time, 2018, um, his brain tumour started to grow again. 
he slowly declined until just before Christmas 2018 we lost him um, but I think and this is we owe such a huge debt to the everybody that we we were engaged with the nurses his, his nurse specialists the OT the carers our local GP surgery um, everybody listened to us everybody supported us they accepted nothing was normal they they all bought into the harebrained ideas and the daft things we did um sorry <coughs> we loved we laughed and we made so many great memories and we just owe everybody such a huge huge debt that we'll never be able to repay sorry <coughs> And, and the thing is, we made the most of every moment. And although we've lost our son, sorry, although we've lost our son, we've, we'll carry that with us forever. We really did make the most of every moment. Sorry. <clears throat> I don't think anybody here wants you to apologise. It might be that you just all get us going and it'll be an advert for Kleenex. Um, but it's it just makes all the difference that we can hear what differences that made. And I, I think potentially, as you called it, the harebrain, but the imagination and allowing that imagination. I think so often we feel just held back sometimes in in our clinical roles by not being able to go do you know what let's be able to think laterally and just be able to try like we all want to do is give people the support and be of service as it were to serve patients and families to get the most out of it and I think sometimes resources are our, our own worst enemy because it restricts us but I I think it's an amazing tribute to Matthew and thank you so much for sharing um because you know that his story enables us to challenge ourselves to make sure that we can aim for that excellence and we can you know work together to try and create wonderful beautiful memories after someone's gone and yeah I, I think on behalf of everyone I can see them running through in the chat there are millions of thank yous coming through but really the, a personal thank you for um a being here moving your schedule but mostly just taking the time to to share Matthew and your family story so thank you so much thank you thank you